Hello and welcome to yet another VRChat video tutorial. Um, this one is going to be a little bit different. I'm not going to be covering a singular subject uh, like with a say optimization video or with a uh, Cat Splendor Tools uh, video. This is going to be kind of a, uh, a mega video of sorts. So I forgive uh, the probably pretty scary length here. Um, I'm going to be covering the entire process of bringing it MMD from the MMD format into Blender, performing decimation, um, fixing the armature, uh, doing texture atlasing, uh, merging bones for use with dynamic bones, setting up root bones for dynamic bones, um, exporting to FBX for use in Unity, then setting the avatar up for use in VR chat by way of the avatar descriptor component, and then also adding in some uh, dynamic bones, um, just for an example. Uh, depending on exactly uh, how much I can manage to squeeze in here, I may also put in a very short bit on uh, an animation override, uh, just for a simple little face shape. Um, I will also have another video out soon that will cover that in much more detail. Um, but let's go ahead and get into just the beginning here. Uh, this is going to be split up kind of into chapters. There should be uh, timestamps below the video um, with a section on each that shows basically uh, the, the different sections you can skip to. So if you only have a question or you want to see a specific part of it, just skip to it there. Um, so this process is going to be up to date as of the end of December 2017. Um, it may change in the future depending on what new, new tools come out or if the process changes due to changes in VR chat itself. Um, so let's go ahead and move on. Let's switch here. The first thing I'm going to show you here is kind of the text version of a guide that I made on the Steam Guides forum. If you go to VR chat in Steam and you click on guides, you can actually find this um, in uh, the listing there, it has all of my current videos and things like that, but that's not really important. What's important is I'm going to use this as kind of an overview for the tools that you use um, and also what exactly an MMD is, um, which you may or may not know coming into this. Uh, an MMD is a uh, model file used by a program called Miku Miku Dance. It's used for like anime music videos and dances and stuff like that. There's tons of these models all over the internet. And moreover, there are some resources to get extremely high quality models uh, from the internet. Um, you can get them from DeviantArt as well. They tend to be a little bit lower quality, much higher poly count, things like that. Um, however, uh, it, it is still a good source. Uh, so if you want to go through this and read a little bit more about it, uh, I would encourage you to do so. This is a little bit more detailed than I'm doing here. Um, there will be one thing that I'll go over in detail here that's also here. Uh, respect the rules with uh, MMD models. Um, because VRChat is growing at a literally exponential rate, um, it's, it's becoming, uh, I guess, more prevalent on the internet. Uh, for and, and and more well known um, that a lot of us are using MMD models uh, for our avatars in VR chat, and some of the models may not permit that. Uh, they may specifically say in some cases that I've seen um, that you are not permitted to use the avatar in VR chat. If you have a question about it, you can always attempt to contact the author. Uh, at least make best efforts in that case. Um, in my particular case, I managed to find my MMD uh, author for my children though that, uh, that I use as my avatar in VR chat. I contacted them on Twitter, literally just using Google Translate because I don't know Japanese and they don't know English. And I explained the use as best as I could. Uh, and they were happy to give me the model um, and to, rather to let me use it in VR chat. Uh, and as far as the licensing from the game goes, um, Toho's licensing is pretty open uh, for Dojin works, for fan works. Uh, so thankfully, um, I'm probably okay on that front. Uh, if we start violating these rules on a wide, uh, I guess, a, a more... Um, a more prevalent kind of way, like, if it shows up more often, then these artists aren't going to be releasing their models publicly as much as we want in the future. Uh, we really like their art, obviously, because we're using it, them as our avatars. Um, so please try and respect the rules within the best of your ability. So anyways, let's skip ahead here. 
Um, let's go down to the required tools. Um, there are some tools that you're going to need to import a custom avatar, and there's several required ones. Um, first off is Unity 5.6.3p1. Um, this is the current version as of, it's. I know it says November here, but it's also as of December 2017. Uh, there are no plans currently to move on to a new branch of Unity just yet, but it will happen in the future. Uh, Blender 2.79. These are all links here. I'll provide a link to this guide in the description so you can just scroll down to it. And also, I'll keep this up to date as it changes. Um, you'll need a Blender script called MMD Tools, uh, and I'm gonna. I have a direct link to the zip file here, but I'm gonna show you the actual the way to find this branch, uh, PowerOpies branch, and which version you should download. I'll do that in a moment. Um, you'll obviously need the VRChat SDK, um, which will require a VRChat.net account, which you need anyways. Um, this is actually how you, through Unity, upload your avatar to the VRChat server. Uh, and finally. Uh, I this used to be a recommended. It is now required. Um, Cat's Blender plugin is an amazing plugin made by uh, several members of the VR Chat community, but namely, um, give me all your cats and Hotox. Um, it is it it used to be a ridiculous effort to bring in your first model because every single MMD model is different. Um, this plugin will save you hours upon hours of messing with armatures and visemes and eye tracking and optimization. Um, it isn't perfect. Uh, I will I will reiterate that multiple times here. It isn't perfect, but it gets the job done 95% of the time. Um, I also want to point out that you need to keep your SDK up to date. It is extremely important that you update, check for updates as much as you possibly can. Uh, I believe the last update was released sometime in mid-December um, as of this video. Uh, it is extremely important that you keep up to date on, on that. Uh, I have some recommended downloads here as well. Uh, Cube Shaders, which are um, probably the best shading, uh, the best shaders written available free uh, for VR Chat users uh, for anime characters. Um, it is actually written um, mostly by Cubed Paradox, who is a VR Chat developer, and then by TCL, who is also a not a uh, VR Chat developer, but definitely a contributor to the community and a very very smart person. Um, regardless, the, the shader is awesome. You should use it. Um, Paint.net, I also recommend for texture editing. Um, so I would install that as well, just in case you, in case you want to do a little bit of texture editing. Um, and this tool, I actually need to remove. Um, so PMX Editor English, uh, or PMX Editor, I guess, just for short, is a tool to edit MMD models. Um, it is the native tool uh, and the preferred tool for most people to build MMDs. Um, but there's basically no use for it anymore. Um, Cat's Blender plugin handles all of the translation for us. It does it perfectly, and it does it basically with a button press. Um, there's no reason to use PMX Editor, and in fact, doing translation through PMX Editor now will actually screw with um, Cat's Blender plugin as we move on. So anyways, those are the tools that you need. Again, the links are right here. Make sure you get these versions. And if the this says something different when you come and look at it, then get the different thing. Get something that's the most up to date. Uh, keeping this stuff up to date on your computer is extremely important because there's a lot of problems. For example, with the SDK, if you're using an old one, then you have problems with it. Uh, and there's a lot of problems that can be solved by using the up to date SDK. Same thing for MMD tools and for Cat Splendor plugin. So anyways, let's move on. I said I was going to cover uh, MMD tools in a little bit more detail, so let's go ahead and just search for MMD tools. So not the, the, the important thing I want to pick out here is you don't want to choose Sugiani's branch here. I know in my previous videos I pointed here, but look right here. See how long ago this has been updated? This is this is this is a very old uh, branch. Um, so let's go ahead. I'm going to do some things that you don't need to do because again, you can just download through this shortcut here. But um, let's go ahead and look at. I believe it's under. Oh, it's under issues. And let's go to this right here. And then let's go here. So, anyways, this is the version you want. Uh, ignore all the stuff I did, did before. I'm just showing you that it's very out of date. This is the new version that is being maintained actively. Uh, it was updated 12 days ago, or I'm sorry, nine days ago is the latest uh, update. Um, looks like they just yeah. Um, so this is the one you want, and you don't want to do releases. Do not download a release. Go to clone or download. Click on the green, big green button, and click download zip. Um, so the next thing we're going to cover is how to install that. So let's go ahead and save it, and I'm going to save the file. I'm going to show you how to install that, and we're, I'm also going to show you how to install Cat's Blender plugin. So now that you've got uh, the latest MMD tools, let's go ahead and grab uh, the Cat's Blender plugin from vrcat.club. 
Uh, VRCAT.club is this site right here. Let's actually go to the root of the site. It is a forum uh, run by myself, by Ave, and by Psych. Uh, we have a kind of community forum here where a lot of people um, post a lot of their information on events and things like that. But here what we care about is tutorials and tools. So go to VRCAT.club, go to tutorials and tools, go to Cat's Blender plugin, which should be near the top. It's either first or second. Uh, and you can download the plugin here. Um, you, it also, they also provide a link. Cats provides a link uh, to the proper version of MMD tools that you need. Uh, but here's the plugin link right here. Um, it's just going to lead you to a zip that downloads directly from GitHub. Um, so if I've, I've already downloaded those two files. Uh, the MMD tools because we downloaded it before and I just I downloaded it beforehand just to prepare uh, So let's go ahead and pull up the files that I have here. Uh, this is the model I'm going to work on I'll get to that in a minute um, Here is the blender MMD tools uh, and here is cats blender plugin So let's go ahead and go to the blender plugins folder or the add-ons folder more specifically So I've drilled down all the way to it, but I'll show you how to get to it right here all you need to do, let's, uh, where can I get to? Let's go here, this PC, there we go. So it's gonna live in program files, not x86, because this is a 64-bit application. So we go into program files, you find Blender Foundation, Blender, the latest version, 2.79. I believe, is it Python or scripts? I always get this mixed up. You go to scripts, you go to add-ons, and now you get this folder here, which I already have open here. You're going to see a bunch of files here. It's got a bunch of stuff, basically plugins for Blender, uh, various controls. Let's go ahead and open up the uh, Blender MMD Tools Dev Test Zip. Um, I strongly recommend either using 7-Zip or WinRAR for this, uh, for reasons I will show you in a moment once we get to the model. Um, so let's go ahead and open up this folder. You'll see a folder that says Test Samples MMD Tools. This is just a clone of the actual GitHub uh, master branch. So what we're going to do is just grab the MMD Tools folder. This one specifically, not the rest of this crap. You just want MMD Tools. Um, and, and just to be clear, when you open the zip file, this is what you see, right? You double-click on the zip file. You see Blender MMD Tools, MMD Tools Dev Test. Open it. You want MMD Tools, this right here. Let's take this, drag it in, drop it. Computer will say, hey, you need to have administrator permission. Hit continue because you don't care. And then you'll it, it'll dump it into the folder. So there you go. You've now installed MMD Tools, and we will enable it as soon as I open Blender. So let's go ahead and close this. We're actually not going to use that method to install Cat's Blender plugin because there's a different way that it wants to be installed so that it can handle updating automatically. So let's go ahead and close this uh, zip file. Let's open up Blender. So Blender is going to lo look roughly like this when you open it for the first time. Uh, there will probably be a camera and a cube and a light in the scene. Um, let me go ahead and turn on my on-screen display here so you can see what I'm pushing. Um, if you do have those things on your screen, all you have to do is hit A, or I'm sorry, not Control A, but A, which selects everything, and then press Delete, and then press OK. A should select everything on the screen. They should turn yellow with a yellow outline. Delete will pop up that dialog that says, are you sure you want to delete like this? And then you just click on that, and it'll delete everything in the scene, because we want to clear it out before we start working. Uh, once you actually do that, um, stretch out your side window here a little bit, uh, and then finally go to File go to save startup file and click it. This will make it easier so you don't have to remove this crap every single time. In fact, I'm gonna do it right now because I want it to save that I have this OSD display running. So I'll click it and then click it again. Okay, so a lot of pop-up or a lot of commands in Blender involve clicking on another uh, pop-up that appears beneath your mouse. So just make sure you're clicking on it uh, when you get to it. So let's go ahead and install those tools. First, let's go to file. And then we'll go to user preferences right here. You can also pull it up using control alt U. Um, you'll quickly notice that Blender has a ton of keyboard shortcuts and the faster that you learn it, uh, the better. Um, so I've already searched it up here. So that kind of was a spoiler there, but all you have to do right here is hit refresh um, just for the sake of doing it. You probably don't need it if you just booted up uh, Blender. Type in MMD and you should see object MMD tools here. And when you drop this open, it should show you all these different things here. Um, the latest version is 060. According to this, um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the versions I don't think are being updated uh, on the current master branch. Anyways, all we need to do is check that checkbox and then hit save user settings. So we've now installed MMD tools. But that's not everything. We still need cats plugin. So let's go ahead and hit install from file. We're going to go, it's going to pop up a, a special Snowflake Blender um, like browser dialog. 
Let's go to downloads and I'm gonna to go to tutorial downloads and I'm gonna click on cats blender plugin master zip. I'm gonna hit install from file and there we go. It now appears in 3D view, the cats blender plugin right here. It automatically fills us out. We click check, save user settings. So while I was doing all of that, you may have noticed on the left side here that three tabs have appeared, MMD tools, MMD utils and cats. Cats is what we're going to be using almost completely exclusively. Um, the, the, this is where you do all of the fun stuff where you import the model, you fix the model, you do separation by materials for decimation, translate, you do eye tracking, you do visemes, you do bone parenting, optimization, you can update the add-on through here. Um, you can optimize by merging materials, by mer uh, merging bone chains, by atlasing automatically. This plugin is ridiculously useful. Um, there's no reason that you shouldn't be using this. You're just causing pain to yourself. Any problems that CATS plugin actually has in that 5% chance that you have a model that's going to be weird and different, you can probably fix anyways by using different parts of uh, CATS Blender tools. So let's back up a little bit. So I mentioned before that you would potentially have a problem with your zip file of your MMD, whatever you find. Hey guys, Future Tupper here. I am actually just going to pause really quickly here and say that if you're using WinRAR, you can skip most of this next part. So go down to the description, find the timestamp that is labeled WinRAR, and just click on that instead. If you're using 7-Zip, then you need to do the rest of this. Um, the main thing that you need to find, or that you need to see right off the bat, is that I actually have Japanese characters right here. Like it's displaying in Windows Explorer. The reason why is I've installed the Japanese language pack. Uh, if you need to do that, just open your start menu, type in language, open up region and language settings here, um, and then you can click on add language and add Japanese. Um, once you've done that, you also need to make it, uh, you need to change it so that non Unicode programs use um, use Japanese as the default character set. Click on region, this is the part I forgot here, and when it pops up you'll see a administrative um, tab on the region pop up here. You want to change system locale for non-Unicode programs to Japanese or uh, Japan. Uh, this will allow you to extract files for, uh, using 7-zip uh, uh, and retain the Japanese characters in it. And I'll show you why that's an issue. If I open up this file here you'll see that some of the uh, textures have Japanese characters in the name. If I, ex if I didn't have this setting set, those characters would be um, just garbled up. Um, another way that you can get around this problem, um, I should probably mark this somehow in the video. Uh, I guess I'll put it in there. If you want to use Rin WinRAR, uh, it's actually pretty easy. You can just go to the uh, language settings and you can just say, uh, in, it, use uh, Shift JIS encoding and it will solve the problems for you. You'll still need to install the uh, Japanese language pack um, as I, I demonstrated before, but uh, WinRAR is a little bit easier to work with. I just prefer 7-zip. So anyways, we're done with that. Let's go ahead and extract the model. So as you saw here, I have this model here that I'm going to work on. Um, all we need to do is open it up to a decent point where we actually want to extract it out. Here's the PMX file, the actual model file right here. If we look in here, here are all the textures. Oh, oh boy, that's not what I wanted to do. There we go. Uh, there's all the textures. So we're going to go... Mm, 7-Zip is not... not see, I, I said I prefer 7-Zip and now it's giving me problems. I'm going to select all of that the other way, go into my model workspace and pretend that I didn't already do this before. So what I have here is I already extracted the files into here and as you can see the files, the texture files already have uh, the character sets in there. So let's go ahead, go back into Blender and let's begin uh, the first part of the importing process. So now that we've got uh, the entire, I guess, workspace set up, all that really remains is to import the model and start working on it. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do is let's set up a, uh, a startup file or a startup, uh, I guess, setting for Blender. Uh, when you first start up Blender, um, before you actually include anything, or before you uh, do the things I'm about to show you, you'll get like a cube in the middle of the scene, you'll get a camera, you'll get a light that's hanging out up here somewhere. Uh, go ahead and select all of those things. Actually, hold on, let me turn on my OSD display, I always forget. Um, let's uh, turn on uh, this display down here. And what you would do if you had a 3D cube in the scene, let's just go ahead and add some crap in here. So there's a camera, let's add in like, what is there? I think there's a lamp in here, a hemi light that's normally in here. Um, and then there's like a cube or something like that. 
Um, let's just let's just stick in a cube. There we go. This looks a little bit different than what you probably see. I, I think it's just a regular cube in your ceiling, but for some reason I chose a meta cube. Anyways, you'll see something that looks like this. It's easy to get rid of all these things. Just tap A. Um, you may have to tap A twice if you've already selected one of those things. And hit the delete key like this. Uh, you hit delete and a little window will pop up. Press enter and it will go away. So anyways, once you've got your scene set up such that you like that you have all the crap deleted here and you've kind of stretched this out a little bit, we can see that it's it's actually, well, I can actually read all the labels here. What you want to do is you want to go to File and go to, where is it, Save Startup File. And if we hit that, it will actually save this entire setup for us. So every time we open up Blender, it'll be a nice, just clean, blank slate for us to work with. Additionally, uh, something that I will strongly encourage you to do the entire time you're working on a model, you want to use Save control s and save as copy uh, all the time so what i typically do is i have a working copy that i just kind of go with the entire time i usually just call it the name of the model and then as i go along and i finish major steps i do save copy and i name it like so it would be like model underscore atlasing done or model underscore decimation done or something like that anytime that you finished a bunch of work that you don't want to lose just like in a video game you want to save a copy um, so let's go for a, a quick um, overview of how the controls work in Blender. Uh, most of the navigation is done with your middle mouse button. So if you have a mouse that does not have a middle mouse button or a scroll wheel, um, please, dear God, it is 2017, get a new mouse. Um, so once you get your new mouse, uh, this is how you move around in Blender. To rotate, you just hold down the middle mouse button and move your mouse around. And there you go, you can rotate around. To uh, to pan around, um, to pan left, right, up, and down, you can hold down the left shift key and m hold down your middle mouse button, move around, and you'll get the just panning. Uh, if you hold down the left shift while you're uh, scrolling, you'll get panning up and down, or rather changing your elevation. And then finally, if you just scroll in and out without touching anything else, then you get the zoom function. So now that we have that, let's move on. Um, let's go ahead and import our model. Um, we're going to go ahead and click on cats, which you've already installed. Uh, let's click on the import model button at the very top here. We're going to spend pretty much all of our time in this pane on the uh, left side here um, for a lot of our tools and buttons and stuff. So click on import model. Let's go to our uh, model, which I have in just recent here, but you may have to navigate to it. You want to find your PMX file. So let's click on that, but not double click. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is un we're going to hold down left shift and then click on physics and display. We don't care about those particular things. Those are things like rigid bodies and joints. Display, I think, usually imports things like... Uh, pfft, uh, I'm honestly not really sure what display doesn't or does not import. Um, we only really care about the mesh armature and morphs anyway, so that's what we're going to bring in. Um, additionally, we want to change our scale. 1.0 is way too big. Um, MMD models come in absolutely massive if you import them at 100% one, at scale. Um, I personally go with 0.1. Um, Hotox from Cat's Blender Tools, um, one of their developers, recommends uh, 0.08. So 8% of the total size. Um, let's go in between and do 0 0.09, which is 9%. Uh, so my typical setup that I like is 0.1. Hotox goes with 0 0.08. Let's go with 0 0.09. So let's hit enter there. Our scale is set properly. These settings are what you want to stick with. Clean model uh, is checked. Remove doubles is unchecked. Fil fix IK links is unchecked. Rename bones, left, right suffix is checked. Rename bones, use underscores, unchecked. Um, what is this option here? I've never touched it before. Rename bones to English is going to be disabled because we're going to do that with uh, with Cat's Blender tools. And use mitmaps for uh, UVs. We are going to leave that checked. Uh, so finally, let's go ahead and hit import in the top right here. And we will get our little fox girl. Uh, this model is from Kimono Friends. It is Red Fox um, or whatever the actual Japanese name is. I don't know. Doesn't matter. What we're going to do now is click this magical button here. Fix, mo fix model does a huge amount of stuff. Um, it, re it fixes the armature, which are these bones that you see here. They're basically what your uh, your body attaches to in VR chat so that you can move your arms and stuff around. Uh, it fixes the textures. It does some work on the textures. It changes the rendering mode so you can actually see the textures. Um, it does a huge amount of things. It also translates bones. Let's see it listed off if you hover over here. Um, it uh, mixes weight paint, so there's no hard cutoffs for movements, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, there's no hard cutoffs for, um, 
oh god, I'm blanking on the word, for, oh, morphing of the mesh uh, based on bone movement. Um, it corrects the hips for full body tracking and also for general compatibility with VR chat. It joins any extra meshes together and it corrects shading, which is what I talked about before. So anyways, enough talking about it, let's hit the actual button. So it's gonna give you a lower progress bar that'll pop up in your cursor and then you'll have your model. So there's a couple things that we see right away. Um, first off, we can actually see the textures, like I said before. If you look on the top of your screen here, we see a very important number, tries. Faces, we don't care too much about. Verts, we don't care too much about. Tries are what we care about the most. In VR chat, you are only permitted to use models that are less than 20,000 tries. Here we are 3,175 over the limit, uh, an additional one, because you can't actually have 20,000 polys you can, or tries. You can only have 19,999. Uh, so we're going to have to deal with that in a moment. Um, but the next thing that we are going to do after we hit fix model is let's translate everything in here. Because if we look at the model, I'm going to right click, by the way, uh, right clicking is how you select things in Blender. So I right click on the mesh over here and you see the orange highlight appear over the mesh. Let's right click on the armature and all the bones get highlighted. So there you go, there's your lesson. And of course we can rotate and pan around like we did before. So if we click on the mesh, right click on the mesh, and then we click on this little ball here on the right side, that is the material pane. These are called panes. There's a bunch of different buttons to them. This one is the material pane. We can see that there are a ton of materials on this model, which are in short, they're textures, but they're a lot more than that. But for the sake of this explanation, they're basically textures um, that are all in Japanese. By the way, you see how this stuff is all popping up in Japanese? You probably see a bunch of boxes. So let's go ahead and fix that for you real quick. What you need to do is if you go to file, you go to user preferences down here. Let's go to system. And I believe it's under system. Might have to, oh, here we go. Under system on the right side, you'll see international fonts. Just click that checkbox and you'll get actual Japanese characters here. It, I mean, it doesn't really matter. We're gonna translate all of it anyways, but it just helps so you don't see a bunch of garbage on your screen. Um, so what we're gonna do now is we're going to do translation. So this, we're, gonna, we're going to translate the shape keys, which is something else. This button right here is the data tab. And we can see that there are a bunch of shape keys in the model. Shape keys are basically what move the face around so you can make it look like that you're talking. Uh, so you can make it look like you're winking, that kind of thing. This one I believe is winking. Yep. So you see as I drag it left and right on the value, you can see that she is winking at us. Um, let's go ahead and clear that just in case I didn't do that right. So we're going to translate all of those. First, let's click shape keys. So once we click that, watch the right side here. Thank you, Trogdor, for the commentary. Uh, we can see that all of the um, shape keys have been translated. Some of them don't make too much sense, but some of them translate to the same thing every single time. In particular, ah, uh, huh, your, um, I think there should be here somewhere. Uh, things like that. Um, Comorant is a, a common one. Um, a lot of these are mouth shapes um, for speaking. This will become important later on. So let's go ahead and move on to bones. They've already been mostly translated when we click fix model, but I like to click it anyways. If you notice on the top side, we get a bunch of uh, status messages every time we click, click translate. That is a common theme with cats. Um, we get uh, basically updates on what the script just did. So let's do meshes and objects. There's only two meshes, two objects or whatever. They were already translated. That was, again, just out of habit, clicking all four of these. And then finally, let's click on materials, but let's take a look at the materials first. First they're in Japanese, and now they're in English. So the way this is working is it's actually sending off queries to Google Translate via a uh, questionably <laughs> ethical method of accessing the API, but it, either way it works, it doesn't really matter. Um, but uh, what we are now going to do, let's see what's on my list here. Oh, now that we're done with translation, let's look at bone chain merging. Um, so I'm skipping ahead a little bit here in, I guess, learning about this kind of thing. Um, but let's go ahead and look at the armature here. Uh, so when I click, right click the armature, the entire thing gets highlighted. And if I hit the tab key, watch down here in particular on this button, it switches over to edit mode. Tab, object, tab, edit, tab, object, tab, edit. So this is very important. We'll be using this a lot in a little bit. Um, when, once we're in edit mode, we can see that these bones right here for the hair, they might be useful for something like dynamic bones if we wanted to animate the hair, but this is kind of too many. <laughs> um, too many bones. Um, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to merge these bones down. So let's go to optimization. Let's go to bone merging. And we are going to go to uh, whatever these bones are called, which I believe they're back hair and then some uh, suffixes to them. 
Uh, so we have the correct one chosen. Back hair to one, five bones. Let's change the merge ratio to 50%, or rather, let's keep it at 50%. The reason why we're going to do this is because if we do it to 50%, it's going to reduce these chains from four to two. This is going to increase the efficiency of our use of uh, dynamic bone scripts once we actually get to that point in Unity. So let's hit merge bones. And watch the magic happen. There you go. Half of them have disappeared, but not really. What's happened is that the bone that was up here got merged down into this one, and the bone that was here got merged down into this one. So we have less bone to bones to animate, and l basically half of the uh, CPU load required to animate this right here. Um, there's not much else that we're going to do to this model, in particular with bone merging. Um, this one's pretty light. The only thing that's left is the tail, and the tail is just one chain. And unfortunately, Cat's Blender tool is not uh, detecting the bone chain of a single one like that. Um, you probably would have to do that manually. That's a little bit out of the... Um, actually, it's not really outside of the context of this, uh, of this video. Let's go ahead and give this a shot. I uh, didn't plan on doing this, but we'll try it. So let's choose a bone, if you want to do this manually to like the tail. Let's choose a bone that is, let's reduce this down from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, down to say 3. So let's merge this one into that one, and then this one into that one. So what we need to do is we need to select this bone. Let's hit Mix Weights, and what it'll do is it'll take that bone, merge the weights into its parent, which is this one here, and then um, make sure the parenting works for any bones that were above it in the chain. And then, of course, it deletes that bone. So let's do the same thing here. Mix weights. There you go. Now we only have three bones, where before we had five. Uh, we're reducing CP load. Uh, very important, and something I cover in the optimization video, but I will reiterate on many times here. So moving on, we have finished bone chain merging. So let's look at uh, dynamic bone root creation. So what we, uh, if you look at the model here, we have a skirt that has all these little skirt bones that are uh, parented to the hip. Um, if you try and do this, if you try and animate the hip by putting the script uh, on the model and then setting this bone as the root bone for the dynamic bone script, you'll get all kinds of animation issues. When you sit down, it won't qu quite look right. There's problems with that. So anyways, we have a way to solve that with this bone parenting thing right here. Um, before you use either the bone merging or the bone parenting uh, module here, make sure you click refresh list um, just to make sure that your drop down list is accurate. So let's go ahead and go to uh, our list here. Let's find the skirt, which is skirt one zero, 10 bones. That sounds about right. Let's hit parent bones. And what this is going to do, it's going to be very quick. It just created a duplicate of the hip. It reparented all of the skirt bones to that duplicate. And then it, um, actually that's about it. And then it parented that duplicate to the hips. So it will move with the hips. It'll it'll basically be the exact same bone as the hips, except it won't it won't be ma animated by mechanism. Um, so it won't cause any problems with um, with animations and things. So one thing you might want to check before you finish with everything on your armature is you want to test it out. So what you can do is in Cat's Blender tool, you can hit Start Pose Mode, and you'll be able to right click on whatever bone and hit, you have this little rotation ball that appears and you can rotate it and see that your arm works properly and the sleeve doesn't become detached and things like that. If your sleeve is detached, um, you may have to go into the armature, find whatever extra bone underneath the arm doesn't look quite right and merge it down using mix weights. Um, so if there was a sleeve bone here that wasn't looking quite right, I would go to spine, chest, uh, either left or right shoulder, left arm, and I would look for extra bones here. So if there was like something additional on above left shoulder, then I could mix it down uh, by selecting that bone and then hitting uh, mix weights. Uh, and you do that in edit mode, of course. You do that and you hit mix weights and it'll merge it down. A lot like we did the tail earlier, even though this version doesn't have it. So actually, let's just go ahead and do it in the tail and I'll show you here. Um, so if I want to mix this one down, all you have to do is hit mix weights and it'll merge it into the bone above it, um, which I showed you before. So you can do the same thing with sleeves if they don't work properly. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the other bones and make sure things work properly. So the ears maybe, let's make sure, oh, that's cute, adorable. Let's go ahead and move the arm around. Okay, that works. Let's move the leg around a little bit. That doesn't look natural, whatever, that's fine. Um, and then once you're done testing everything out, actually, let's try out the tail. I wonder what the tail looks like. It looks like a tail. Cool. Um, once you're done with everything, hit stop pose mode. It'll re return everything back to normal and you can continue onward. 
So anyways, we can continue on. We're doing this with uh, some other bones. Um, let's do this with the hair bones, but there's a problem here. You see that the front hair and the back hair are actually two separate uh, bone sets here, and gimmick, which is strangely what the uh, ears translated to up here, these ear bones also are uh, set off from the, or they're parented to the head, and we don't want to put an animation on the head. I've never run into problems with putting dynamic bone scripts on the head, but it's better to be safe than sorry. So let's go ahead and choose back hair because it's the one with the most bones to reparent. Let's click parent bones. And now let's take a look at what that actually did in the model. So if we open up armature here, which is the actual base object of the entire model, and then click on armature again, we'll get into the skeleton of the model. By the way, make sure you're in edit mode for the uh, rig before we do this. Um, so let's now go to the hips. Let's open this up a little bit. Go to spine, go to chest go to neck, go to head, and let's drag this open for visibility. We can see that there's the root bone that was created by the script, and we can see all the other hair bones and ear bones that we want to make um, children of the root bone. So there's an easy way to do this. Select by holding down shift and clicking on each one that you want to create uh, or you want to move into the root bone. And then finally, the last bone you want to select is the root bone. Make sure you select this one last or else this will screw up. Once you do this, hit control P and then hit keep offset. What we just did is we just batch moved all of the parenting for all of those uh, bones underneath the root, uh, the, the back hair root. So we can just leave it like that. All we have to do if we wanna animate all of those things uh, with the exact same settings is just mark those as, uh, or is just put the dynamic bone script on there and then that's it. So we're gonna do the same thing actually again, but back all the way up at the hips. I want to animate the tail, so let's go ahead and mer merge the tail into the root skirt, same way we did before. First select tail, shift click on root, control P, keep offset, there you go. It's now in there. So what is next? Oh boy, decimation, my favorite part. So now that we have uh, fixed the armature about as good as it's going to get for the moment, uh, we need to bring this model underneath um, the poly limit. So this, this model is pretty close. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and hide the armature here, which I'm going to do by right clicking on the armature and hitting H, which hides the armature. If I want to unhide everything um, that I've hidden, hit Alt H and that unhides everything. Um, so yeah, that's just a quick aside. Anyways, um, back on target, uh, you can see that this model has, uh, is pretty decently, oops, hold on, this is another thing. If you go into edit mode and you see that the face is changing or a visium is changing, you need to go into the data portion and make sure you have basis selected. Uh, this actually affects, um, this is how you edit shape keys. If you want to edit a shape key, you go into edit mode on the mesh with the shape key highlighted. You can edit it, um, but we don't want to do that now, so let's go to basis. So anyways, um, this is gonna be a pretty easy model to decimate. I've seen a lot of models, especially from DeviantArt, get in the upwards of 120,000 polygon or triangle range. Um, in that particular case, uh, decimating those down is gonna result in something that looks probably not all that great. But on the other hand, a lot of those models also have a lot of hidden geometry, which is one of the things we're going to deal with here. Um, so let's go ahead and I will illustrate the three different techniques that you can use to decimate uh, your model. So the first technique that you need to use for decimation um, is called planar decimation. Um, but before we do any decimation, we need to do something called separating by materials. So while we're in object mode, um, oh, hold on, there we go. Uh, while we're in object mode, if you go to Cat's Blender tool on the left side here and you see the separate by materials button, let's click on that. And what it's going to do is it's going to iterate through every single material or texture on the object. Um, it's a little bit more complex than that, like I said before. Um, but uh, it's going to iterate through all of them and separate the mesh out by whatever, organized by whatever texture or material is assigned to them. Um, so a uh, important thing I'm going to reiterate on uh, before, during, and after this entire process is you see all these different meshes. When you're done with all of this, merge them. You merge them using join meshes right here. This is deadly important. Do not leave these meshes unjoined. If you leave these meshes unjoined, it is horribly optimized. You will tank your frame rate and everyone else's frame rate and people will hate you. I'm, I'm pretty sure people have actually gone on witch hunts trying to track down people who have unmerged meshes. Uh, just please, for the love of God, just hit this button. It's dead easy. Uh, anyways, moving on, I'm going to be reiterating that, reiterating on that again, but anyways, um, 
let's go ahead and take a look at some uh, potential targets. Uh, let's take a look at this hair right here. So if I click, right click on the hair, you can see that now it is on its own little separate mesh. And you can see that it's uh, it's decently complex. It's not too crazy. It looks like it's only um, you know 1, uh, 1,376 tries. Not that big of a deal. Let's look at the back hair. 1,942. Let's look at planar on the back hair. So the first thing that you're going to need to do before you do apply any decimation modifiers is you're going to remove the shape keys on this particular part of the model. But now you might be a little bit confused because before I defined shape keys as being something that are primarily used on the face, right? Well, shape keys exist on every single one of these me these meshes, or at least the index for the, the shape keys, kind of the place where those shape keys are held. Uh, but we can remove them from parts where they're not needed. Uh, this is kind of also a preface uh, to a warning. Uh, you should never, ever, ever decimate your face, your hands, your le or your legs. Basically anything with a joint, like your fingers, um, ideally not your arms either. Um, so anything where you would have a lot of bending, especially your hands and especially your face, you don't want to do decimation. Um, the reason why is if you do decimation on your hands, when you bend your fingers, um, you'll get all kinds of weird jagginess and weird effects. If you decimate your face, uh, well, you'll lose all your shape keys. You'll be unable to use things like lip syncing, um, which you don't want to lose. Um, that being said, it can be very difficult to do decimation on an extremely high poly models where the face is super, super dense. Thankfully, this one is not too bad, so we're not going to worry about it. Um, so anyways, don't decimate your face. Don't decimate your hands. Don't decimate your legs or arms. There you go. Let's do the, the hair, though. So if I right-click on the hair object, and you can see that I have it highlighted. It's I know it's all orange, but I'm going to press tab to show you I have this highlighted. Um, let's open up the mesh object in the hierarchy here. Let's drop down the data uh, object here and you'll see this key.002. Um, if you're not sure if a particular part of your model has shape keys or not, what you can do is you can select the mesh. So let's take a look at the, let's take a look at the ears for example, which for some reason tra translated to four garrison. Under the data tab here, you can see shape keys. The only one is basis, which means there's no shape keys. On the other hand, if I click on, click on the face, now there's tons of shape keys. Obviously we don't want to remove these. So if we look at the hair, there are no shape keys. So we are safe to right click on this and hit delete. What we can now do is click on this little uh, wrench icon here, which is the modifiers tab. We'll click on add modifier and we're going to click on decimate right there. Um, let's go ahead and move that up to the top of the list. Very important. Um, that may be actually incorrect, but just move it to the top of the list. This armature one right here is something that is important for later on. Um, it basically attaches the armature to the model. Either way, don't mess with that. Just move this to the top of the list. Let's click on planar. So what planar does, and I'm going to actually look at this number first, uh, what planar does is it takes the angles between these edges here and it calculates the angle between um, the one face to the next face. If they are within five degrees by default for the default setting, uh, it will attempt to merge them into a quad. So this is this this um, specificity of me saying a quad versus a try is very important here because planar is not really the end all be all for decimation. Um, it's not the greatest. So let's take a look at, so if we look at collapse with a ratio of 1.0, that means we have all of our faces still. We can see that we have 1,942 faces. Uh, and if we look up here, it says 1,942 tries. If we hit planar with the default settings, and we come out of edit mode, of course, we can see it drops down to 661 faces. Um, but if we click, so what, what did we have before? 1942 down to 661. Did it just change numbers on me? No, it didn't. Okay. So let's go ahead and hit apply. Very important. Please don't forget to hit apply. And now our decimation is complete here. So how many tries did we get this down to? 1298, even though faces say 661. The reason why is uh, that we care about tries is because Unity converts all the quads in the model to tries. So that is what is actually counted when um, the SDK looks at how many uh, how many polys, or it says uh, in the SDK, uh, to count for decimation. So even though it says that we managed to get it down to 661 faces, those are quads. We actually still have 1,298 tries, uh, which isn't quite enough. We're still at 22,530. So let's look at the next technique, um, which is the collapse modifier, which you probably saw a second ago. 
Um, so let's go ahead and right click on these little poofy things on the, um, uh, thank you cat, on the uh, arms here, uh, which translated to four Momoko. Let's go ahead and I know these don't have shape keys, so we can go ahead and right click, delete, shape key is gone. Let's add a decimation modifier right here and let's take a look at collapse. So these particular, I'm gonna hit tab right here, these particular meshes aren't like, they don't need that much detail. They're flat lit um, when we actually put the correct shader on them and uh, there's no need for this much complexity in it. So let's go ahead and just reduce them down by a ridiculous amount. The way you do that is uh, you just drag this slider down. So the faces we're starting out with is 2720. Uh, let's come out of edit mode and let's drop it way down to like 10%. So we're now at 280, and you probably saw the change in how it looks as we drop it down lower and lower. But let's do 10%. Let's actually do evenly 10%. Point 0.1. There we go. We are now down to 272. Hit apply, and now you can see that these things are far less complex. Um, now, this isn't perfect to collapse. Sometimes it does some weird things like you see down here. It doesn't properly join things. And it, things look a little bit odd. So I, I would try and limit heavy use of the collapse modifier. Um, it also screws with UVs. So if you have something with a texture on it like this and you use the collapse modifier on it, these lines might dis disappear or something like that. So it may not be the best uh, to use in situations like that. Uh, now, f we have just a couple tries to get rid of. Uh, we only have about 82 to get rid of. So let's look at uh, the third type of decimation, which is straight up just geometry deletion. Um, so this model is actually pretty well optimized. Um, aside from probably the buttons. Yeah, it's a shame. But just for the sake of this example, let's go ahead and get rid of this button. So what we can do is we can actually just remove geometry if we don't really care about it and that will save us tries obviously so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to highlight some of the verts in this uh, I'm in edit mode right now on this central mesh and I'm going to highlight some of the verts on this button I'm gonna do that by pressing C which brings up the cursor select I'm gonna highlight just by clicking and dragging over a couple of them let's just do that I'm gonna hit escape to get out of cursor select mode and I'm gonna hit control L to select all linked uh, vertices. So now that, select, that has selected the entirety of the button. I'm gonna hit delete, I'm gonna hit vertices and the button is gone. So if I hit tab again, we now see that we are under, under 20,000 tries. We are at 19,916. So decimation is complete. Uh, decimation on this model is really easy. You lose very little detail, uh, but that is because this model is pretty low poly to start with. Um, your experience will be different. Um, but anyways, let's go ahead and uh, move on to the next step. So now that you've finished decimation, um, you have one of two things you can do. You can either cheat like me and move to a model that I've already finished decimating, or you can uh, go ahead and hit your join meshes button, because if you don't do it, your next step will break. And if you don't join your meshes, you will probably be the subject of a witch hunt. That's not really that joke. Uh, please join your meshes. It's extremely important. So anyways, while I adjust my microphone and probably get some noise, uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next step, which is eye tracking. Eye tracking is pretty cool. It makes your eyes move around and track people that you are uh, talking to. It keeps swapping to ah for me. That's, that's a little alarming. Hold on. Let's make sure it's not doing that. Um... So it, it makes your eyes track people as they go around you. It can look a little bit strange on, uh, MMD models sometimes on anime characters, but in this particular case, it actually ends up looking pretty decent. Um, so let's go ahead and go to eye tracking here and take a look at it. Mesh, head, left eye, right eye should look pretty much like this. Blink left and blink right may look different. Wink two and wink right two are what this one comes up with. Uh, let's go ahead and make sure that those actually look like winks or blinks, not winks. Let's look at wink two. Yep, that looks like an eye closing, and wink right too. That looks like an eye closing. See, wink and wink right makes it look like that she's got like a happy face going on, but we're not gonna deal with that right now. So let's go ahead and clear our shape keys and go back to basis. So let's go ahead and hit eye tracking. So cool, eye tracking was created, and you can see at the top that eye tracking is done. The way that we can test this before we ever even get into VR chat, by the way, there, there used to not be any way to do this uh, reasonably. You had to do it either manually by rotating bones or by bringing it into VR chat and testing it. We can hit testing on the top here and hit start eye testing. And if we zoom in a little bit and pan up so we can actually see her face, we can adjust uh, where she's looking and then hit test rotation 
and you can see her eyes are moving around a little bit. So this model actually looks decent. It's pretty subtle, the movement, and I kind of like it. But if it's too subtle for you, you can adjust the eye movement range. So let's turn it up to like 1.0-ish set range. So now she looks a little bit farther to the left and to the right. It does rotate the pupil or the iris a little bit, which looks a little strange in my opinion, but hey, I'm trying to cover everything here for you. So fool around with this. Um, this is just for testing here, these bars here. Eye movement range, if you set it, it will sit at that setting. I'm going to go ahead and set it back to 0.8 because I like that. Um, you can also test blinking. So let's hit test for blink and reset shapes and lower lid test. Obviously does nothing and reset shapes. It does nothing because we assigned it to basis, which means that it's not going to move. Once you're done with your testing, just hit stop eye testing and you're done. It resets back to normal. So the next thing we are going to do is even simpler than that. We are going to create visemes. Visemes are what you make your mouth move when you talk. And in VR chat, you have to set it up a certain way with certain naming so that it actually uh, uses them. So for these particular, it, for Cat's Blender tool um, actually handles most of the, all, well, not most, all of the naming for you and all of the blending. It creates all of the shape keys based on three. The shape key for the ah vowel, for the o vowel, and for the ch sound. So we are going to use, it automatically assigns ah, your, and there because that is typically what those vowels translate to when they're run through Google Translate. Um, you don't really need to mess with this. You kind of just hit create visemes and it works. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the mesh and you can see that there's some VR chat uh, visemes that have already been created. But let's watch and see what happens when I click on create visemes. Now we have a ton more, and of course it tabbed away from it. We have a ton more, look at that. These are all the different vowel sounds and all the different mouth sounds. So if we go to ah, she opens her mouth. If we go to k, she opens her mouth still. So, I mean, this isn't perfect. You could make this manually and make them look really, really good, but it's a lot of work, and this is basically sufficient. Um, there's also, there's a lot more advanced techniques that some people use with like muscle posing and stuff like that, um, but honestly this is what I use and it works perfectly fine. So we're done with visemes. Let's move on. Um, another optimization step is what we're going to do next and this one is to do with the materials. I'm going to hide the uh, armature because we're pretty much done with it at this point. Let's right click on the model and let's look at all the different materials we have. So we have a lot of them here and what we might notice is if we look at some of them, some of them are identical. So if we look down here in the bottom right you can see the different textures. So for face and for face shadow, there, this one actually doesn't have that too many that are that are identical. But either way, in most cases, there's duplicate ones here that use the same texture. A very easy way of reducing your your uh, material count is going to the optimization uh, drop down here, going to material, and click on combine same materials. Now watch my list on the right. Oh boy, nothing happened because none of them are identical. So normally it, what would happen here is if I hit this button, it would merge any materials that the, have the exact same settings. In this particular case, it doesn't appear that the models have exactly the same settings on some of these things, which makes sense. This is a pretty minimal model and there's a lot of small textures for this. Um, so this is as low as we're going to get uh, for the different materials on the, uh, on the character. Um, so we can solve this optimization problem a different way because do you know what's better than fewer materials? One material. So let's do texture atlasing. There are several ways to do texture atlasing. I actually have a video on a technique called manual texture atlasing that I personally think is the highest quality version of doing texture atlasing. However, here I'm going to show you how to do it in a completely automated way. So if you don't want to take the time to do that, you push, you push a button and it works. So let's click on the Atlas button here under optimization. Um, atlasing is the act of taking all of these materials and moving into one material with one image defined. So let's go ahead and set up some settings here. I'm going to set the margin to 0.05. I'm going to leave angle at 82. I'm going to leave area weight at zero and I'm going to change texture size to medium 2048 or 2K. Um, we're also going to see, okay, this is one texture, okay. Uh, go ahead and make sure that this is checked. You probably don't want to pack islands just because it might mess around a little bit with some stuff um, with the way uh, the way some uh, UVs might run over each other. I haven't had good experience with pack islands here, but it doesn't really matter. 
Let's go ahead and hit create atlas. But before we do that, let's let's take a close look at the model. So I'm going to uh, take an image here, and I'm gonna I'm 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 gonna freeze framing here, so I can take an image when I'm doing editing. We can look at the quality of the model here. We can see the textures and that kind of thing. There's honestly not that much complexity to the textures here, but there is some places where you know sharpness is good. So let's hit create atlas and see what happens. It's going to take a moment, especially if you set it to 4K, which you really shouldn't set it to. But first off, you'll notice that the eyes have gone black. Um, that is a problem with uh, the transparency that's been set. Uh, you'll also notice that there's some weirdness going on with the mouth here. Um, so th there's some issues with this particular one that we've run into uh, that we probably wouldn't want to continue on with normally. Um, what I should have added before I did this little part is you need to save a copy before doing this. Um, you should have saved a, a, a pre-Atlas version. Um, God, uh, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? Because I didn't save one. Um, but you need to uh, save a copy before you do this because this is a destructive edit. Once you do this, you can't go back. Um, so we are going to go ahead and uh, continue on with this model anyways. But that's perfectly fine. So... Now what we need to do is, I've actually spotted something I need to remove. Let's edit the mesh real quick. There's this little shadow thing. We need to remove that. There we go. That'll save us a little bit of stuff. Um, so the model doesn't look as great as it used to. It lost some of its fidelity. Um, if we go back uh, and redo this, actually I'm going to do that now, uh, we'll end up with something a little bit better quality. So one moment and I will come back with a better version. So now that I've redone all that work that I just did, thankfully it didn't take that long because Cats is awesome, um, let's go ahead and uh, save a copy before we continue onward. So we're going to, I'm actually going to hit save first and I'm going to hit save copy and we're going to call this uh, pre-atlas, pre-atlas stop blend. There we go. Um, so in case the atlas doesn't look quite right, we can come back. So let's mess with the settings a little bit more. Let's try pack islands this time. Let's set it to 2K. Uh, let's keep that margin at the... 0 0.05, area weight will leave the same, angle will leave the same. Let's hit create atlas and see what happens. Do, do. So we still have the problem with the eyes here, but it looks a little bit better. Actually, it looks exactly the same. Pack Islands didn't really help, help that much, did it? So this is basically illustrating one of the, the, the few, I guess, it's not really a criticism because honestly the atlasing is not really something that CATS does. They're using something called the Smart UV po Project to create these atlases. Um, what uh, the problem that I have in particular uh, with this is it doesn't turn up, it doesn't come out with uh, particularly good atlases. Um, they, they often kind of muddle textures together and they don't play, pay particular attention to what uh, parts of the model need to be big and what need to be small. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to manually texture atlas this model. Um, I will create a manual texture atlas. Uh, you don't need to do that, um, but I would strongly suge suggest doing so using my manual texture atlasing video. So if you want to, check out that video real quick. Uh, I'm going to go through that process and we'll be back in a moment. Okay, so we are done with atlasing. In my particular case, I did my manual atl atlasing technique. It took probably about 15 minutes or so to get it just the way that I liked it. But you can see, even though I only have one material here, everything looks just about right. Um, additionally, I did also have to adjust the transparency on here, which may have fixed the issue before uh, with the, the black eyes with the cat's ver excuse me, with the cat's version. Um, I didn't try it, so that's on me. If you have that particular version and you want to use the cat's uh, atlasing tool, um, make sure that you follow the instructions in the, um, actually I'll just show you here, screw it. Uh, once you actually have the atlas here, you have the one material left over from the atlas, so it'll have a bunch of numbers after it. Go to the texture pane while you have this uh, material selected. Go down, make sure that alpha is checked and set to one under influence. Go back to the material, go down to transparency, click this checkbox, and under when you have Z transparency selected, turn alpha all the way down to zero. And that should fix that particular problem. But now we're basically done. So now that atlasing and everything is complete, uh, all we have to do is export this to an FBX. FBX is the format that Unity expects um, for uh, models to be input. It is the, one, the format that it'll convert everything into if you throw something into it. So let's go ahead and make work easy for Unity because Unity is a fickle beast and export it to FBX right now. So make sure that you save your final copy. Let's hold, go ahead and hit Control S. Let's go to File. Let's go to Export. And we're going to click on FBX. 
Now there are particular settings that you want to use to export these things. Um, I'm going to put images on the screen right now, right in the middle here, something like that. Just put them like right here, dude. That's fine. Um, I'm going to walk through them as I go through them. So there are uh, four different tabs you want to look at here. Um, I'm going to go to my VRChat presets here and I'll show you how to save this in a moment. Under main, you'll want all of these settings to look like this. Geometry, you'll want them to look like this. Armatures, you'll want them to look like this. And animation, you'll want them to look like this. If you don't do this right, you probably won't get shape keys or your bones won't export properly, stuff like that. Um, also, I have camera and lamp deselected on main just because uh, out of habit. Um, but anyways, once you set up your settings, how you want to save it or how you want to use them every single time, if you just hit this plus key here and you just say VR chat settings, all you have to do every time that you pull it up is just click on VR chat settings. I know that's a duplicate here and it will get it, it will set it to the settings that you have there before. Um, so there you go. All you need to do now is hit export with these settings. And that's pretty much it. We now have a FBX file. So if we open up uh, model workspace here and we go in this folder here we can see if we organize by date modified there is the redfox.fbx file right there there's the redfox blend that we are currently working on up here here's the texture atlas that I created using the manual texture atlas uh, method which looks like this now if you created it using um, using cat's blender tool it's gonna look like this It's gonna say generated atlas bake and blah blah blah, blah timestamp on it or some random number and it's gonna look something like that um, you'll want to put both of these into Unity and I'll show you how to do that in the next section. So now that we've finished everything that we need to do with Blender, let's go ahead and move on to Unity. Uh, the first things that you are going to need to do is download a couple of things. Um, you probably already saw the links that I had before, but we'll go over again, them again really quickly. Um, we'll have a couple downloads that we get to as we go along. Um, however, the primary ones that you want to grab uh, are of course the Unity SDK and uh, I'm sorry the VRChat Unity SDK and the um, and Cube Shaders uh, which will allow us to apply a shader in game that makes this model look well more like this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and assume that you've already installed Unity 5.6.3 P1 that is the current version as of the end of December in 2017. This may have changed, uh, just you should always be checking the VRChat docs, which you can get to by docs.vrchat.com. Click on Get Started uh, and just click on Getting Started here and it will give you an up-to-date information on getting, uh, getting the correct tools installed. You can see a link right here to Unity 5.6.3 P1 and the VRChat SDK uh, in the documentation. You can also get it by going to the vrchat.net slash homepage and clicking on SDK here, which will give you a download. Um, for Cube Shaders, uh, which is another Unity package, um, you can go to vrcat.club again and click on go to the thread in tutorials and tools. It should be sticky to the top of the forum. If you then go into the thread and click on, you can get the latest release here. You'll be brought to the releases tab in the uh, Cubes Unity Shaders uh, GitHub page where you can download the latest version. Uh, the latest version as of right now is 0 0.21, uh, which they released, it looks like, about three weeks ago. Um, so we will go ahead and, well, I'll assume you've downloaded these. I have already done so. I've got them right here. So let's go ahead and boot up Unity. Um, Let's see. Yep, that works. Okay. Uh, I'm going to create a new package or new project for this because you won't have any projects here. Um, if you just click on new right here and you can create a new pr uh, project just this way. We're going to call this one tutorial proj. Uh, here we go. And hit create project. It'll create all the necessary directory structures for you. It typically does this in the documents folder uh, in your... Uh, in your user directory. So if you click on documents, you'll find your folder in there, which will be important in just a moment. Um, so the next thing we need to do is we need to import the packages that we just downloaded, namely the SDK and Cubes Unity shaders. The way that you import any Unity package, there's a couple ways to do it. Um, you can find the file itself. Uh, let's go ahead and just import the VRC SDK this way. You can find the file itself, double click on it, and it will import the package that way. 
um, that is one way to do it. It'll pop up with all of the files that it's going to be importing, allowing you to preview what's actually going to be added to your project and hit import. Uh, the VRChat SDK does take a moment to import. Uh, it's got a lot of um, DLLs that it has to link and all that kind of stuff. Um, so while that's going, I'll explain the rest of the process here, what we're going to be doing. Uh, after we bring in these packages, where I'm going to bring in the files that were created in Blender. Uh, we're going to handle rigging. Uh, then after that, we're going to check the rigging configuration, which is an important step that a lot of people forget about. Um, we will then place the model into the scene, set up the materials for the model. Uh, we'll fix scaling using a Unity cube, uh, just kind of as a, a ruler. Um, we will then import the Dynamic Bones plugin from the store and set up Dynamic Bones on the character. I'll set up the avatar descriptor and the visemes on the character. Then we'll import Muscle Poser from the store, which is another useful uh, plugin. Uh, and create a basic animation that we can use for an override. After that, we should be pretty much done. So anyways, we now have the VRChat SDK imported. So let's go ahead and move on with another method to import a package, which you can do via the assets drop down up here. Uh, so if you click on assets, click on import package and hit custom package, you can then start going through all of your different files here. We're going to go ahead and go to my tutorials download folder and I'll find the cubes shaders V21 package, open it. And it's the exact same way as before. So you can just double click on the package in Explorer um, or in a file menu, whatever you want to call this. Um, or you can import it via the Unity drop down menu. We'll click import. As you can see, it's creating folders in our assets uh, folder down here. Assets is where all of your stuff is stored. Everything from imported packages uh, to shaders to models, to textures to materials, uh, prefabs, all that kind of stuff. They're all stored down there. So what we're going to move on to now is, what did I say? Um, let's go ahead and bring the files in for our avatar. So the way I like to do this is I like to create a folder and just call avatars. Go into that, create a folder, and create one for this individual one, which we're going to call Red Fox. So let's open that up. Um, let's go back to the actual model uh, workspace here where we have the Red Fox. The files, as I pointed out before, that we care about in this particular situation are redfox.fbx and the texture atlas. Um, so what we now need to do is, uh, oh, I'm sorry. If you haven't done texture atlasing, which you should have done, but if for some reason, if you did not do it, uh, instead of importing, obviously, your texture atlas, you need to import all of your textures here. Um, but you should be doing texture atlasing anyways. So what we'll do before we do any of this is now create one more folder inside of the Red Fox folder. We'll call it textures, open that folder, and drag our texture atlas in, or your other, your um, your texture files. It doesn't really matter. You need to bring in your textures before you bring in your model, or else uh, importing will get all weird. Uh, if you do that accidentally, um, well, I'll show you what to do with that in a moment. Um, another thing that we need to check is make sure we don't have any cats crawling on the desk repeatedly. Then we check the texture import settings. Take a look at some of the stuff here. Uh, the alpha settings are something we want to check on. Um, you probably don't want to have alpha is transparency uh, on here. We'll deal with that in a di different way. Um, however, the default settings should be mostly fine. Uh, so we will go ahead and leave that as is. So let's go back to the root uh, folder for Red Fox. Let's open up or drag in the redfox.fbx file, which is the actual model. So now that we've got her dragged in, the next thing that we need to do is we need to rig this as a humanoid. Um, in the particular case that we're working with here, uh, the character is a humanoid, as, a, as in it is a bipedal character with two legs and two arms, a head, a neck, a spine, a chest, a hip, uh, and one, one hip. Um, then... This is what you would want to do for anything that follows that typical uh, layout. If you have something that's strange, like, I don't know, like a four-legged character or things like that, things get significantly more complex. Um, there are several ways to work around that. I will not be covering that here because that is more of an advanced topic. However, uh, what we need to do now is if we click on the actual model down here in the assets, we go to the inspector up here. Um, you'll see import settings up here. So we'll see model, rig, and animations. Go to rig go to uh, the animation type, change it to humanoid, and hit apply. It'll take a second as it automatically detects the bone layout. Let's go ahead and check and make sure it worked properly. I clicked on that way too quick. Um, what you want to do after you've applied it is hit this configure button here. 
So let's take a closer look at the model that we've imported and make sure that things play nice. Um, so first off, let's look over here on the right. Think Because of cats renaming everything, it's pretty easy to quickly check and make sure all of our bones are assigned properly. Hips should be in hips, spine should be in spine, chest should be chest, and upper chest should be set to none. You should never ever have anything set uh, in upper chest. If there is something set in upper chest, click this little dot right here, scroll all the way to the top of the list, and select none. Leave upper chest blank. Leave it as set as none. Extremely important. Uh, left shoulder, left arm, left elbow, da, 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 right, 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 yep, 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 all good. If you want to set toes, and if you have toes that you can assign out, um, then you can put them here. In this particular case, this model does not have toes. Uh, toes can allow you to kind of step on, step up on your tiptoes if you get up high enough. Some people like that, some people don't. It causes some issues with uh, the height of the character in game. But uh, we'll leave this as is. This model imported uh, pretty much with the rig working perfectly, thanks to Kat setting it up for us. Um, so let's go ahead and hit done here. And then finally, we are going to drag this character into the scene and take a closer look at it. So the way I like to do it is I like to drag it into the hierarchy here on the right because it places it directly at zero, zero, zero. First thing you'll notice is that something doesn't look quite right. Uh, it's transparent. That is because we need to make some changes to the materials. Materials are basically like materials in Blender. They contain information like um, textures, uh, shaders, settings for those shaders, things like that. So if you go into the materials folder, which was created when you brought your uh, avatar in, click on the texture or textures. You can hit control A and it will select all the, t the textures in your, uh, or all the materials in your uh, folder. Let's take a look at the settings here. So we're using standard shader and we're in transparent rendering mode. So we can fix that pretty quick by just hitting opaque. So this is a flat um, lit, or not flat lit, but is a shaded lit uh, using the standard Unity shader um, uh, setup here. Let's go ahead and make some changes so it looks a little bit better. Uh, first off, let's go ahead and use cube shader. That's going to make this look a lot better. Um, Let's switch over to, so I'm going to click on the shader drop down here, go to Cubed Paradox and click on Flat Lit Tune. You can now see that the character is actually flat lit like how it looked in Blender. The next thing we want to do is we want to change the rendering mode from opaque to cutout. Now your model may disappear here, but don't worry. Drag your alpha cutoff down to probably about as low as you can go but without things getting weird. Um, so probably around like 0 0.01 or something like that. Um, what this is doing is it's setting the transparency cutoff. Um, if a if a point on the texture, uh, the alpha channel, is beyond a certain t uh, transparency level, then it simply will just not render that particular pixel off of the texture. Um, it's not perfect, but it's probably the best result that we have right now until we get uh, full alpha channel support in textures. Um, the next thing that you may want to mess with is with the outline mo or with the shadow. I'm sorry. Um, you can also see that if you want to get into more advanced use, you can set things like a color mask, a normal map, an emission map. You can change the emission color. Uh, you can mess with tiling. Uh, I probably wouldn't mess with the tiling in the offset since you've so carefully set up your UVs before. Um, let's turn shadow down a little bit. That's just kind of a personal preference. I like to set it down to about 0.1. There we go. And then this is very important, outline mode. I typically go with tinted outline. Uh, even if you don't want an outline on your model, which looks like this, and personally I think tinted looks pretty good, I would normally turn the outline down a little bit, maybe to 0.1. See, I, I think this is this looks fairly good. However, a lot of people don't like um, the outline look to it, so what I would do is I would not set outline to off, I would set outline width to zero. The reason why is you want to be able to keep double-sided uh, rendering of the uh, of the mesh. As you can see on the inside of the skirt, um, it is uh, tinted there. If we turn it to off, it's no longer going to do double-sided shading. So you're going to be able to see right through any faces which the normals are facing away from the camera. Uh, in other words, you would be able to see from the back side of meshes. So what we're going to do instead is set it to tinted, set the outline to zero. Uh, I'm going to set it to 0.1 just out of personal preference. And this is a, the, the outline width is a purely aesthetic choice. Um, it's, it's up to you what you want to choose. Um, I think I usually run with about this size. You can also adjust the color of the tint. So if you want to tint it, um, and what I mean by tinted is it takes the color of the texture and then it tints it uh, to create the outline. So if I make it a very light uh, color for the tint, you can see that it's the outline here. And let's turn this up a little bit just so you can see. Let's change it to 0.4. 
You can see that the outline is actually orange for her orange shirt. Um, however, uh, it is slightly tinted um, from the original color to indicate that it is an outline. If we change it to white, then it's going to be the exact same color as the texture it's sampling from. If you change it to black, it's just going to be black. Um, I usually stick with a kind of grayish color like this, and I like to stick it to like 0.1. Let's see how dark that is. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. That's great. So now we're done with most, uh, actually pretty much we're done with the cube shader set up here. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do with shaders. You can set up, uh, there's uh, no way screen space shaders, which lets you set kind of a, a texture that stays in place as you move your head around and look at the model. There's um, Snap Cyber Shader, which is this cool kind of rolling emissive effect of a circuit board kind of deal. Uh, there's a bunch of cool stuff you can do with it. Um, however, if you want to apply a shader just to one particular part of the model uh, and not to all of the model, you're going to have to do a little bit of extra work. You're going to have to make sure that that particular part of the model is a separate material. Um, and that is something I'll probably cover in a different video. It's a fairly short process, but there's several ways to do it, and I want to make sure you guys have all of the uh, options available for you. So uh, that'll be something I'll research later. Kind of just came up in my thoughts right now. Um, let's see, what's the next thing we need to do? Oh, we need to fix scaling. Uh, so the way I typically fix scaling, there's a couple ways to do it, but this is, I feel like, the easiest way. Right-click in your hierarchy, click on 3D object, click on cube, and it'll drop a cube into your view. Um, you can change your movement modes for objects in the top right or top left here. Let's go ahead and set it to the translate tool, uh, just for so we're not rotating the cube when we don't need to. I'm going to set the position of the cube for X and Z to zero. Um, I'm going to set Y to let's see here. Actually, let's do this first. Let's for the scaling. Uh, I'm going to set the X to 0.1 and the Z to 0.1, just so we have kind of a stick. And then let's drag it over here so it's out of the way. Um, let's make her, I'm trying to think how tall I want her to be. Let's say 140 centimeters, which conveniently is 1.4, um, meters in this, in, in Unity. Unity works in all meters. And let's go ahead and set Y to half of that. So let's set that to 0.7. So what that now means is that the, this stick that I've created is 1.4 meters tall or 140 centimeters. And it is, uh, the center of it, which is right here is set 0.7 meters or one half of 1.4 off of the uh, off of the zero plane. Um, so what we now want to do is we want to rescale the red fox down that sh down so she's approximately matching that um, this cube. So I'm going to move this a little bit closer. So there's a couple ways to do this. Um, if you want to do it just by writing numbers, you can adjust the scale here. So we could say like 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.8. Okay, we're getting closer, but maybe you want to fine tune it. A good way of doing this is changing to the scaling tool, which is this bu one, this button right here. You can see that it changes to a bunch of little boxes. And if you click on it and just start dragging, you can kind on the center box. Don't do these side boxes or else you're going to squish them down like that. You don't want that. So click on the center box and start dragging. Let's bring her to about there. That looks like she's about the right height. And if you want to check the perspective, you can mess with your camera perspective just by clicking on these little arrows here. And you can set it to flat projection by clicking on the flat face of the cube. And we can now see that she's a little bit taller than the thing. So let's drag it down just a little bit. Hello, cat. Yes, thank you for the fourth time running into my microphone. Um, excellent. So now she's about the right height here. So let's go ahead and uh, move forward. So I'm gonna come back out of projection mode or flat projection mode and let's go ahead and just hide the cube. Um, next thing that we are going to do is let's import dynamic bones from the store. So asset store is where you pick up all of your uh, assets that you purchase. Uh, in particular, I'm going to be downloading two of them. Uh, the first of which is dynamic bones. So I'm going to just search for dynamic bones which I've already purchased it's twenty dollars it is well worth it go ahead and click on import hit import here and there you go dynamic bones is installed um, dynamic bones is basically the way that we move hair around and stuff like that in the scene so that the character uh, actually has a realistic movement to their hair and say ears and stuff like that so before we get started let's go ahead and show how you would test this sort of thing if this thing had dynamic bones on it, but I'm going to show you what it looks like without it. If we hit the play button at the top here and then click on scene, if we move her around, nothing's happening. Her hair isn't moving. Her ears aren't moving. She's stiff as a board. So now what we're going to do is we're going to add dynamic bones to the model using those root bones that we set up a while ago. So let's go to add component. Let's type in DYN for dynamic bone. Let's add a dynamic bone component. 
you'll see a bunch of different settings here, but the most important ones are root, all of these sliders here, um, and potentially maybe exclusions if you didn't do root uh, setup properly. Also colliders if you want to mess with that, which we'll do momentarily. Um, so let's go ahead and set one on our hair. So we're going to go up to the, the bone structure until we reach neck, head, our root hair bone that we set up here. Whoa. Excellent. Yes. Thank you, cat. Six, no, five times now she's run across my desk. Uh, anyways, what we're going to do is now assign um, the root back hair, which is what we set up before, um, to the root bone right here. And we'll see that a bunch of very faint white lines come up representing the... Um, the dynamic bones that have been created. I'm going to use my typical settings I use for hair and other things like that. Um, and also skirts, I think I used this for when I did do that. I set damping to 0.5, elasticity to 0.1, stiffness to 0.1, and inert to about 0.85 or 0.9. Um, so what these different things do, you can tap, you can mouse over them to see um, what these things do with very short and terse tool tips. Damping is how much the bones slowed down which I'm going to translate to basically if the, the bones were a spring Damping is how fast the spring st stops oscillating back and forth Elasticity is how much force is applied to each bone to the original orientation So basically how quickly does the bone try to return back to its original state and then in stiffness how much bone original orientation is preserved uh, basically how much of the original um, the original position of the bone is respected when movement is being taken into account. And then finally, inert uh, is how much the character's position change is ignored in physics simulation. I typically set this fairly high just because it makes it so that the, because all of our, all of the bone movement is uh, affected by character movement uh, in VR chat. So this uh, is the kind of end all modifier. Like this will affect every single movement of the bone. So now if we go into play mode here, and we click on scene, we move around, you can see that the hair is moving slightly and the ears are moving slightly. So that looks pretty good. Um, now what we're going to do now is I'm going to add some colliders to the hands. So colliders basically allow you to interact with the bones themselves um, and let you play around with uh, play around with your own hair essentially. So let's go down the left shoulder, left arm, left elbow, left wrist. Let's say on the middle finger, I'll add this component. Uh, let's say we want to add a dynamic bone collider. And if we look at this giant yellow circle that's just appeared, we need to drag this down by quite a bit. So we're going to add a couple zeros in front of our radius. Uh, let's change this to maybe that, 0 0.001. Um, that looks about right. So you want the circle to kind of surround your hand like that, but not be too crazy. Uh, so what we want to now do is just click on the little gear up here in the top right, click copy, copy component, go to the right shoulder right here, right arm, right elbow, right wrist, middle finger, click on the gear for the transform, click paste component as new, and now we have a collider on both. So if we click there, we can see we have a collider on both hands. We're not done with colliders just yet. We need to tell the, uh, the head uh, hair bones that we need to respect the colliders that we've assigned here. So we are going to go to the dynamic bone script. By the way, colliders you need to place directly on the bone it's being used for. I'm sorry I didn't cover this before, but dynamic bones uh, can be assigned anywhere in the model. I typically put them on the root of the model so I don't have to go digging around if I want to make changes to them. So anyways, colliders, let's go ahead and add this here. Let's uh, drag, actually let's do this the easy way. I know I want two colliders. Let's add two here. Click on the little dot next to the field, add one of them and then add the other one. There you go, you now have colliders. So this could, technique could also be applied to say adding a collider to the head so the hair never clips inside of the head. This isn't perfect. Um, if your head moves faster than the update rate, which is hard capped at 60, um, then you are not going to, it's not gonna act right. Um, it's gonna look a little bit strange. Um, so the best thing to do is just set your inert high enough so that your hair never really moves quite that much. Um, it, that's what I do on my models and it looks mostly fine. Uh, so I would recommend starting out with the settings I provided you here and working from there if you want to try something else. Um, so let's move on now that we've mostly finished with dynamic bones. So let's go ahead and set up the avatar descriptor itself. So go back to the root of the object, hit add component and type in avatar or just AVA and then click on avatar descriptor. 
this is something that the VR chat SDK has added in for us. So let's go ahead and look at our uh, options here. View position is this little view ball that's appeared right here. It's where your eyes will appear in the model. Obviously, we don't want it right there. So let's go ahead and go back into flat projection mode and zoom in a little bit. Oops, I didn't do it quite right. And there we go. So let's go ahead and move this down such that it is about right here. You want to put it out of my experience. I've, I've found that putting it about on the nose is the best policy. The reason why you don't put it directly between the eyes is when you go into an actual standing animation instead of the A pose that we have here, your model moves slightly um, and it changes the position of the character, but it doesn't change the position of the view ball. So I have found typically the best position is about right here. You need to play around with this. Uh, the view ball position is something that a lot of people struggle with to get exactly right. Uh, what I'm showing you is a quote, good enough solution. Um, there are ways for you to really pinpoint down uh, the best positioning for it. Uh, in particular, Mimi has a technique that works pretty well um, that I'm not sure if she's posted anywhere, but Mimi, you should post that on the VRCAT forums. I think you might have. I don't know. I can't remember. Anyways, let's drag this down um, by setting it a little bit lower and adjusting it. 1.4 isn't good. 1.2 isn't quite right. 1. Point, I'm sorry, 1.1, 1.15, 1.167, 6. Let's do that. Excellent. So now what we can see is that we've got the view ball set up in approximately the right horizontal or vertical position, but now we want to fix it for the horizontal position. Actually, that's a, still a little bit low. Let's do like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Play, play with the view ball. This is going to be, you're, you're, you're going to be playing with the Y position. If you want to get this exactly right, um, then you're going to be playing with this for a little bit. And the only real way to test it is by going into VR chat. So what we now are going to do is I'm going to set the Z position quite low. Normally what they recommend, uh, what VRChat recommends is that you set it just kind of like here, uh, but I don't like that. I set mine to 0 0.02, which is inside of the head. Um, the reason why I do that is it makes it feel a little bit more immersive. It makes it feel like that you're actually um, in the proper viewpoint position for the character. Uh, I just have a better experience with that. So let's go back to the avatar descriptor. The next thing we want to look at is the default animation set. If you have a male character, set it to male. If you have a female character, set it to female. It's that easy. Um, custom sitting and standing animations we'll deal with in a moment. Lip sync, this is where we're going to now put in the uh, visemes that we added before. Um, actually, uh, this also has something to do with the um, with the configuration that we did before, the rigging configuration, so we'll go to that in a moment. If you haven't set up visemes or you don't want to set up visemes, that's perfectly fine. But what you need to make sure that you do is in the rigging configuration screen. Oh, let's save this as Red Fox. Um, you want to go to the head right here and unassign the jawbone. Go to jaw and set it to none. Before I click on this, look at what it's assigned to right now. Front hair one. That's gonna look very strange if I don't apply visemes. So let's go ahead and set that to none and hit apply. Because if I was talking and I had my bone, the bone that was applied to it was front hair one, which I'm going to assume is probably this one right here. This would wiggle every time I talk, which looks very strange. Um, but what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna set lip sync to visine blend shape. And then it's going to ask for the skin mesh render that we want to apply to it, which in our case is gonna be body. So let's drag this here. And now we have a bunch of things to fill out. Basically, for all these different visemes, you want to assign them. So we're going to say SIL for silent, P, F, and OU. All right. I hopefully just fast forward it, remembered to fast forward through that because that's a pain. So anyways, you've got all those assigned. Congratulations. Uh, now you have blend shapes for when you're talking. Um, and this is pretty much done for setting up. Uh, the next thing that we need to do, let's see here. Oh, let's import the muscle poser. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna create a cool new animation. I'm gonna create a basic animation override so you can see the, uh, the essentials of doing this. But what I'm going to do to help, doing the, uh, help me with doing this is I'm going to use an asset called, I think it's called muscle pose animator. Uh, can I spell muscle correctly? I cannot. 
All right, here we go. So let's go to uh, Muscle Animation Studio right here, or Edit Editor, and click on Import. This asset is $15. If you're going to be doing a significant amount of animations, especially with your fingers, um, or honestly with any muscles that are on your body, if you want to kind of move it around, that kind of stuff, this is like super well worth it. So I'm going to go ahead and import that, and we'll see how to use it in just a moment. Um, so I have imported it. So I now have the Muscle Animation uh, Editor here. Let's go ahead and create an animation. The very first thing you need to do before you create an animation is hit Control S to save. Create a duplicate of your model by hitting Control D in the hierarchy when you have it selected, and then deactivate your primary uh, model. You don't ever want to create animations on your main model. That is a bad, bad, bad idea, and it will like because adding animations to a model can sometimes be a destructive thing. It can sometimes set screw up the model for use with VR chat. So make sure you create a duplicate, and then go ahead and we're gonna go ahead and create a folder and call it animations just out of habit. And now what we need to do is grab our override controller. So I'm going to search in the top right here for override custom override controller. I'm going to hit control D to create a copy of it. I'm going to drag that into animations, the copy that I've just made. Uh, I can tell it's the copy because it says override. It says one right there. Um, and we're going to drag that here, then click on the folder again. Let's rename this custom overrides controller and let's say Fox overrides. Um, so you can see here that all these different uh, things are the different uh, animations you can override. We can override any of the uh, hand animations, any of the emote animations, any of the uh, like standing animations for idle or prone or running or all that kind of stuff. But what we need to do now is we need to actually create an animation. And the way that I do it, there's a couple ways to do it, but the way that I do it is I right click down here in the assets, I hit create, I go to animation, and I name it something. I'm going to call this one happy. Now what we need to do is we need to actually animate the character. So let's go ahead and drag this onto the character here. Click on the character and hit control six or go to the animation pane right here. And we're gonna see this window pop up. If you're familiar with Flash um, or maybe whatever, I mean, whatever they're calling Adobe Flash nowadays, uh, this may look very similar. Uh, it's kind of a keyframe and um, motion tweening kind of uh, thing. Like it's that same kind of general concept. Um, each unit of time is one second. So between zero and one right here is not zero and one minute, it is zero and one second. You can zoom out to get longer animations, but in this particular case, because we're using this for an override, the override is going to be exactly two frames long. So first thing that we're going to add, let's go ahead and hit the record button here, and you're gonna notice something with the model going strange as soon as I hit it. She goes down into the muscle pose animation. That's because this is, I'm not really sure if this is a bug or if it's just because the animator gets turned off or something. This is what the destructive edit is. Once you do this, then this model is kind of boned for use in VR chat. But that's okay because we have the original one. Let's go ahead and hit add property. Let's go down to body and skin mesh render. And this is where we're going to find the blend shapes. So let's find the uh, happy or the uh, like the happy animation kind of thing. Oh, it was wink and wink right, wasn't it? So let's add wink and let's go ahead and add wink right. Oops, that's the wrong thing. Uh, here we go, where are we? There we are. Wink and wink right. Yep, there you go. You can see the model moving around as I'm adding these things. This is a very, it, it's a strange process. It, it doesn't really like, I'm not sure why it's doing this. So anyways, what we want to do is we want to edit the uh, these values as we have the the time uh, bar right here on whatever position we want it to be in. Oh, also, you're going to notice that it's added some keyframes way out here in the distance for you. Go ahead and right click and delete key on those. We don't want it to be all the way that far out. So the first thing we want to do is let's set our original. Let's set the first frame to be 100 and 100 for that. So now she's got a little happy face. Now let's go ahead and uh, animate the bones because now what I'm going to use this animation on is I'm going to override um, the the victory sign, the V for victory sign, and I'm going to replace it with the exact same thing. Um, so I'm going to recreate it so that it is added into this animation. So what I'm gonna do that with is with that muscle pose animator that I uh, had, and let's go to muscle animation editor. Let's go ahead and pull up the fingers here and just out of habit, I know that I'm going to need negative one for left thumb. And as you can see, it's starting to add things for me as I need them. Then 0.73, or I'm sorry, 0.78 here for the left index. 
0.78 for the left middle, and then negative 1, negative 1, and then negative 1 again, 0 0.78, 0 0.78, negative 1, negative 1. So now we can see if we move this out of the way, the fingers now look like the victory sign. Great, we're done, almost. So let's go ahead and close this right here. I want to copy this entire keyframe. So we need to click this right here so that we have all of them selected. Right click, or I'm sorry, not right click. Hit Control C to copy. Move our uh, time indicator to the next frame, just the next frame, and hit Control V. The reason why is we need animations for overrides to be at least two frames long. You can't have a one frame long animation. So we'll have a two frame long animation here and it's not gonna loop or anything like that so it's perfectly fine. Let's go ahead and uncheck record and close this because we are done. So now we have this animation. How do we apply it? Well, first off, we don't need this model anymore. So let's go ahead and delete it. Let's go, go ahead and reactivate our original one here. And we are going to go into our Fox overrides here, take happy and drag it over victory. There you go, we now have an animation override there. Let's go back to the red Fox model. Let's go to custom standing animations and drag Fox overrides into that box. There you go, we now have an animation override done. You can do anything with animation overrides. You can turn on a sound effect, you can turn on a light, you can turn on a, a prop in your hand. Um, all of them are animated. You do all those things by animating them in the animator. Uh, in the animator, whoa. Um, the animator doesn't just move things. It can basically do anything um, with a Unity component or a, a component on a, um, object in unity that you could do by hand in the editor so you want to change the color of a light you can do that with an animator you want to change a blend shape you can do that with an animator as we saw you want to turn a game object on or off you can do that with an animator you want to change the volume of a sound effect you can do that with an animator uh, and you can do all of these things over time um, so animations are extremely powerful in Unity and in VR chat. this is an extremely extremely basic overview of how to use overrides just to create a face shape um, so now what we're going to do that we finish that is um, actually we're pretty much done. Let's go ahead and show you how to log in. So what you need to do is you need to go to VR Chat SDK and hit settings. We'll click on that and I'll drag this into view. Uh, let's go ahead and hit log out. You need to log in. So I'm going to log in here with my super secret password and then hit sign in. And you will see that uh, you're using the correct Unity version. We are logged in as Tupper, da, 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 all that kind of stuff. The next window that we are going to want to open is the, uh, where is it? Show build control panel, which is also off screen for some reason. So I'm gonna drag this onto the screen. We can now see that first off, it tells us our SDK version date, which by the way, at the time that this is made, 12.12 is the latest one. Please keep your SDK up to date. It is deadly important. Um, almost as important as removing meshes. Uh, actually, it's probably more important than removing uh, or merging meshes, not removing meshes. You can see that we don't have any problems with the model. We don't have any rigging problems. We don't have anything where the, it's saying like, hey, this might not work for full body, you know, IK. This, the, your, your, your shoulder is not the child of ch chest or whatever the heck. That is because CATS did all of the hard work for us. It fixed all of the problems. It set everything up for it. You don't have to wrestle with any of those stupid problems anymore. The only warning that we're getting is warning, what, 19,505 polygons. This avatar will not perform well in any systems. That's wrong. This avatar is one draw call. This is the most optimized an avatar could possibly be for VR chat. The only way we could get more optimized is if we lowered the number of uh, the polygons on here, which would help us with GPU rendering, but GPU is not our current bottleneck. So in short, this model is as optimized as it could possibly be, aside from possibly removing the dynamic bones. So anyways, we're done. Um, congratulations, we have the model completely done. Let's just go ahead and hit build and publish and I'll show you the last part of it. Let's hit build and publish here and it's going to build the actual uh, avatar model for us. And there we go. We now have our model. It's going to pop up this little window. Let's get this out of the way. Name the avatar. Tutorial Fox. Uh, description. Doesn't matter because this doesn't show up anywhere. Content warnings. Doesn't really matter because these don't show up anywhere. Um, and then we click this checkbox. The above information is accurate. And I have the rights to upload this content to VR chat. Very important. And then click on upload. And it's going to sit here and push my upload speeds and it's going to upload the preview image and I'm done. I could log in right now and have the red fox. Uh, that's it. Uh, I know this video was long, 
I know this was difficult. I know it may have been painful, um, but you now have all the skills necessary to bring in literally any MMD model that you want into VRChat. And there are thousands out there, tens of thousands. Um, in, in addition to that, these techniques that I've shown you so far can be used for basically any model. The only nuances that are going to be different is just basically like maybe the rigging will be a little bit different when you bring it in for say Gmod or XPS models. Maybe you'll have to create a rig from scratch, God help you. Um, maybe you'll have to, you know, merge some different uh, uh, textures together with a texture atlas. It doesn't really matter. The process is roughly the same. Um, this is all you really need to do in order to get this to work this way. Um, so congratulations. Thank you for making it all the way through this video. I hope this video was helpful. If you do have any questions, um, feel free to uh, try and hit me up on Discord. I'm, I'm, I'm getting pretty busy nowadays, um, but try and hit me up on Discord. I'm on the VR Chat official Discord. Um, if all else fails, you can also obviously check out the Avatars channel. Um, on the Discord, on the VR Chat Discord, uh, you can check out the Avatars MMD or Avatars Rigging. Um, you can also, of course, go to VR Cat uh, if you have any problems that you want to post about there. You can also go to the support forums for VR Chat, which you can get to by going to the documents, uh, the docs.vrchat.com, and clicking on support at the top. And finally, if you are having major technical issues with the game, uh, you can post uh, an, an issue to that same support form at VRChat uh, docs, or you can email hello at VRChat.net. However, I would only really do that if you're having severe technical problems with the game. Um, but yeah, that's the basic support chain you should probably be using. Um, most of the time, if you're having avatar problems, just go to the VRChat avatars uh, channel on Discord. Um, but that is about it. Thank you very much for watching, uh, and good luck.